much. Nice to see such a lovely turnout. I, I looked at the size of the room and I got very nervous. <laughs> I was going to be asking 20 people to come and huddle around the front, so this is nice. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, and an honor uh, at such a new organization. And so I'd like to thank Justin for and his crew for putting this together for me. Uh, nice to see some friends here that I haven't seen for a while and people I've contact I've been in contact with by uh, email largely, but sometimes uh, people I've worked on other projects with and it's very very nice to see them here today. Originally, I had a grand plan of uh, discussing feminism's impact on society in a, in a rather holistic way, delving into many of the cultural, social, and legal and educational areas in which feminist-inspired policies have contributed to a devaluation of boys and men and their purpose in society. I would have liked to bring together uh, myths around domestic violence that brand men as inherently dangerous to women, teaching methods that ignore boys' pedagogical needs and privileged girls' learning style, and give examples of how our charities and social services discriminate against men as a direct result of an ideological belief system that permeates our university programs, women's studies, schools of social work, psychology, faculty of education, and the law schools. Uh, that churn out biased policies and training manuals in these fields. But obviously that was far too ambitious a challenge for a single hour's talk, so I, I had to settle on one area, and the one I chose uh, is the one I think causes the greatest amount of existential anguish for men and for children, namely the family law system. It is in our court's understanding of the so-called best interest of the child that we see the most unjust the most consequential and the most inhumane results of the feminism belief system. Uh, but I will begin with a cultural illusion that bears directly on my theme and in its way provides unintended evidence uh, for the case I want to make. So it happened that by coincidence on the morning that I was setting out the materials that I wanted to incorporate into my talk, I happened to be reading the art section of the National Post and my eye was caught by the title of film reviewer Chris Knight uh, his column, and the title was Oscar Bait, Do Good Dads Go Unrewarded? And he begins his column uh, saying, when Oscar winners take to the podium, they thank their agents, stylists, directors, gods, and Harvey Weinstein. Seldom does dad get a shout out except as half of my parents. Uh, this year, however, nominees should thank their paternal stars. Fully 60% of the hopefuls for Best Actor and Best Supporting Actor were cast as father figures par excellence. Then he named some uh, father-centered movies this year, amongst them The Descendants, Moneyball, and A Better Life. Knight notices two oddities about the films that I've mentioned. He remarks, these men's wives are dead, comatose, divorced, or otherwise out of the picture. The other oddity that he notes is that good dads are often nominated for Academy Awards but seldom win. The last great dad to win an Oscar was Robert Benigni in Life is Beautiful, and his was a role performed in such extreme circumstances, the Holocaust, that he can hardly be said to be representative of fatherhood. Chris doesn't want to speculate about the reasons for the missing mothers, but I think I could have enlightened him there. The reason is an unspoken Hollywood rule that fathers cannot be portrayed as an exceptional parent when there is a mom around. Nobody competes with mom as the more necessary parent. Dads can only be accorded attention and respect when they are in the situation of a coping single parent. So if the mother is absent, the father may step in and take over her role after he has learned how, of course. In most cases, good dad roles portray a father who is not naturally nurturing and who only learns how to nurture when tutored by the mom or when extraordinary circumstances force him into that role. In other words, when there are two parents on the scene, the mother has to shine. If she doesn't shine, then the father has to be equally flawed or more flawed. Uh, but if she dies or leaves the scene, uh, then the father is allowed to shine because, in effect, he has become the surrogate mother. A few excellent films that follow this rule have dealt with the iniquities of the family law system. Uh, my National Post colleague, columnist George Jonas, once said, 
Uh, you know the family is in trouble when a whole branch of the law is devoted to it. Uh, how right he was, and these films show us why. Um, in 2003, <coughs> Pierce Brosnan produced and starred in a very moving film, Evelyn, based on the true story of Irishman Desmond Doyle, who fought the Irish government and the Catholic Church to overturn an outdated custody law and recover his three children after his wife abandoned the family. In the 1979 movie, Kramer vs. Kramer, the archetype of this genre, a New York mother, bored with childcare, bolts to Los Angeles to find herself, leaving her husband suddenly in sole charge of their little son. The heart of the movie is the riveting evolution of a patriarchy-era father, career-obsessed, domestically disengaged, into a new man, putting career ambitions second to his child's needs, parenting clumsily and frantically at first, but eventually with tender efficiency. Not without realistic missteps and emotional pain along the way, they form a loving bond. The child is happy. Nevertheless, when the mother swoops back into town 18 months later and sues for custody, a patriarchy-era court ignores the dad's obviously superior moral claim and the child's wishes, awarding the mom custody on the basis of her sex. As many new men are shocked to learn, all the midnight feedings, bedtime stories, and soothing Band-Aid applications to scrape knees count for nothing against morally indefensible gender bias in family court. In 90% of litigated custody cases, the mother gains sole custody. Thus, with mom-friendly courts always the trump card up a mother's sleeve, even the best of fathers in all custody negotiations must depend on the mother's goodwill rather than justice for anything approaching equal access to his children. In 1997, when the current Divorce Act came into effect, a special joint committee was convened to make recommendations on child custody and access. After 55 hearings and more than a year of study, the 48 recommendations of the 1998 report for the sake of the children converged on one theme, the sole custody adversarial system as it pertains to the majority of custody and access disputes denies children and non-custodial parents basic human rights and puts children's psychological and emotional health at risk. The report re recommended, quote, the non-rebuttable <coughs> presumption of equal parenting in the absence of abuse as both fair to parents and best for children. But it was ignored by the then liberal government and fell into a political black hole where still it languishes under a majority conservative government. Uh, and in spite <coughs> of this having been a, a, a plank in the platform of the conservative government uh, for some years now. So why, after all these years, it is not the policy of the Canadian government? I can't say. We know what Canadians think on this issue. Polls show that 80% of Canadians support equal parenting, and the social science is airtight on the importance of fathers and mothers in the whole range of life experience as children grow older. University of British Columbia sociology professor Edward Crook, uh, Canada's foremost expert on, on custody, has for many years been writing papers and books on the results of a wealth of peer-reviewed data to support the superior effects of shared parental responsibility. Yet, as he observes, judges and family courts tend to perpetuate old stereotypes, ignoring evidence in cases where the father is provably the more responsible caregiver or presuming fathers only seek uh, custody to evade financial responsibility. Under mounting critical scrutiny in recent years, the judiciary's lack of expertise in determining the best interests of the child has become increasingly apparent. As a result, a new parental uh, responsibility to needs, quote, responsibility to needs discourse has emerged in the socio-legal realm. A child's needs cannot be optimally met by a single parent, however loving. Crux findings show that a child must spend at least 40% of his time with a parent to establish and maintain a beneficial attachment. The movie Kramer vs. Kramer ended happily because the mother recognized that fairness to the child uh, required her voluntary relinquishment of her legal entitlement. Unfortunately, Hollywood is not running the divorce industry in Canada. In real life, mothers are rarely so selfless, 
Court battle endings are rarely so happy for fathers and children. From the day that I ventured into this almost orphan topic in the, the media, I started receiving narratives from disenfranchised dads detailing and often documenting their Kafkaesque adventures in family court and the despair they felt in being forcefully separated from their children, and I know some of you are here tonight. Their stories are and were heartbreaking. I have a file this thick at home. It would be hard to choose one over another as an example of how irrational and destructive family court can be. But again, coincidentally, when I was working up my notes for this talk, I received a, a short personal account from a father that, to me, seems like a perfect uh, vehicle for our theme tonight. Uh, and I have permission from his, its author, Chris Walker. Are you here, Chris? Said he was going to be here. Not here. OK. Excuse me. Say, Walker. Hmm? Walker? I sent you an email. Probably me. Chris? Cliff, yes. Oh, you're Chris. I'm Cliff. No, no, it's Chris. Oh, nice. I did get a lot of emails. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways, here's what Chris had to say. I very much enjoyed your article. I am that father you were talking about. This was in response to a, a column on equal rights, uh, equal parenting I wrote about two weeks ago. I have four court orders to help save my children from their mother's emotional abuse and alienation. She at one point asked for $200,000 in my entire monthly salary uh, in order to see the kids. She said I could live at my mom's for free. A respected counselor accessed the family and made a recommendation to remove the children from the mom's custody. The judges so far have failed to take a stand. The scope of what she has done is too vast for a simple two-hour motion. The Children's Aid Society are, quote, waiting to see what the courts do. Judges will not find her and they will not put her in jail. They tell me that at trial I can get custody to help reverse this tragedy, but I can't get on the trial docket. My children are 13, 12, and 10. I stood in front of two judges and listened to them tell me they could not enforce their own orders to help the kids. They explained clearly that fines and jail would not stop her. So they made a new order for her, which she broke seven days later. They did suggest that perhaps I should stop trying to see my kids. That maybe when they are older, say 18 to 20, they would see what their mother has done to them. They would then come around, and the mother would then be abandoned. I drove six hours last month to see my daughter skate for three minutes. My ex hid them in the competitor's locker room so that I could not speak to them, or her uh, daughters, sorry. I haven't seen my son in two months, so I can tell you from experience that the $100,000 I spent in legal fees does nothing without enforcement. My stories fill three boxes of affidavits, um, and I've spoken to every expert I can get my hands on, and the consensus is that trial is all that is left. Um, if I am successful at trial, there is still a chance my children will go back to their mother. My ex has informed the children that even if daddy gets custody, they can run away and live with mommy. In fact, uh, if I have sole custody, she can still continue what she is doing. I was so shocked, I went to the local Ontario uh, Provincial Police Detachment and asked about enforcement. Sure enough, the OPP confirmed if a 12-year-old can prove they are sheltered, fed, and going to school, there is nothing a parent can do, even with sole custody, etc. So that brought together, it seems to me, quite a number of the themes that I, I see in many other variations uh, in, in reports that people send me. It's by no means the worst case I have read, but I was not looking for the worst case. I was looking for an average case, and that is kind of average. Every single professional in this case, you'll notice, the judge, the CAS, the OPP, uh, think that what they are doing reflects the best interests of the children. And strangely, the best interests coincide with the wishes of a mother who has exhibited clear signs of immaturity at best and unfitness to parent at worst. How is that possible when it is so clear that the best interests of Chris's children are not being served at all? So let's take a look at the system. But just before I begin, I want to make a general stipulation. I know that these talks and this group is not about women bashing. And I, I, I don't want to make this like women are terrible or anything like that. Uh, it, I am feminism bashing, yes, uh, because I think feminism is a pernicious ideology. But I don't blame women who have been schooled in its tenets 
for doing what they're doing. Uh, I don't think any either sex has a monopoly on moral innocence. Both men and women have the capacity and the free will to act with honor and goodwill or dishonor and bad will in stressful situations. But when a man or woman's most cherished relationships are at stake, and when the fate of those relationships are in the hands of strangers sitting in judgment, it strains the bounds of human nature for either a mother or a father to resist the temptations of an unlevel playing field that tilts in his or her direction. In family court, the playing field is badly tilted towards women. If they take advantage of that fact, it doesn't mean that women are intrinsically worse than men. It means they are human. There was a time when courts tilted the other way, which didn't make men villains either, also just human. Justice is supposed to be gender neutral, but gender is still the biggest predictor of who gets sole custody in disputes. And even though fatherhood has changed a lot since 1970, the statistics for sole custody have not, nor have attitudes, which goes right to the top of our legal food chain. Two of our nine Supreme Court justices, when they were court of appeal judges, awarded sole custody to women in over 90% of their cases. Such an imbalance would never happen in any other branch of law. You have to think about that. Cases do not go to appeal without a good legal reason. If they go to appeal, it means that each side has a persuasive case. They don't take it if it's trivial. So it is therefore inconceivable that a 90% gender imbalance can be attributed to coincidence, that 90% of women had the better case, just the law of averages does not allow for that. Um, it's only, it can only be accounted for by bias. For some years now, we have heard the mantra, the best interest of the child, as the guiding criterion for custody outcomes. And presumably, the judges who effect these gender skewed scenarios believe they are abiding by that guideline. But what is the actual definition for best interest? We don't know. It all comes down to a judge's weighing of the situation. But how do judges weigh narratives from two people they don't know and a situation that cannot be understood in any depth under the circumstances and that is absorbed through competing accounts. We treat judges with reverence. We take for granted that judges are the most educated and the most intelligent citizens among us. They are educated in the law, yes, but are they really the wisest amongst us? Because if there's one branch of law that requires wisdom in addition to knowledge of the law, it is family law. First of all, what is the purpose of any court, and for what are courts devised? In every kind of court but family court, judges are deciding or guiding others to decide what is to be the consequences of harms and wrongs that were done in the past. It is only in family court do we have a system where no harms have been done in the past, or none that have been the state's business, and where circumstances will be continually changing in the future, but where judges get to decide where harm may happen and judge accordingly, as if they were gods and could predict the future, not mere men and women with knowledge of a set of laws, knowledge that has no bearing on their real subject, family dynamics and natural parental rights. And natural parental rights are not enshrined in our charter, along with property rights but, rights, but they should be. Family court deals with complex, emotion-drenched, existential issues. Decisions made in family court have life-altering and even life or death implications for everyone involved. You would think that the judges in this court would be hand-picked for their knowledge of human nature, for their emotional intelligence, for their previous studies in psychology or, or criminology or ethics or philosophy or even cultural anthropology. But you'd be wrong. Very few judges have such an educational background and many judges are emotionally illiterate personally. <laughs> I mean it. It's true. It's true. I, I, a civil case that had nothing to do with, with family law, and, and I never met a stupider judge. I mean, he was a very stupid man. He knew the law, but he was unbelievably stupid in every other way. Most have taken undergrad, undergrad courses in history or political science or economics. Some go into law school, as they do in Quebec, direct from CEGEP, which is 
only two years after high school. They take three years of law school and they are generalists. So in general, their knowledge of social science and epidemiology is meager to marginal. They have no idea of the statistics accompanying fatherlessness. They have not read the academic uh, literature on domestic violence. They don't know the statistics on child abuse by women, which is higher than for men in all areas except sexual abuse, or the disproportionately high figures associated with sexual abuse of children by the post-separation live-in boyfriends of mothers with sole custody. As a few recent cases have demonstrated, judges are possibly slowly, but these recent cases have been, have been uh, pursued by people with very deep pockets, so we shouldn't get too excited. Um, an understanding of the horrific scourge of parental alienation syndrome. But most still have no idea that the damage that is wrought by the alienating parent, man or woman, father or mother, but given the statistical li likelihood of mothers having sole custody, more by women. They have not willfully ignored the evidence. They haven't been made aware of it. The result is that judges are just as likely to defer to social theories based in gender ideology as anyone else in society. They are no more likely to know the difference between fringe ideas and sound social science than any third year <coughs> student on campus. Let's not forget that in the 1990s, judges embraced the now discredited theories of false memory syndrome as enthusiastically as the ideology marinated psychologists who propounded it and as a result, many, many lives of adults falsely accused of sex abuse by indoctrinated former children in their care were ruined. But that, that is not to say that judges are not trained at all before they preside in family court. They do take a short backgrounder case uh, course pre pre uh, prepared for them by the National Judicial Institute, the NJI. The NJI is an insular organization whose board of directors is composed entirely of judges and law professors. The program taken by the judges provides, quote, a focus on three major components of judicial education, substantive law, skills training, and social context issues. Social context <coughs> issues. These are the three most frightening words many unlucky Canadian fathers will ever hear. One of the reasons they're frightening is that the words are nebulous. We don't know what these judges are learning in the program. The NJI will not release details of the courses they give, not even to lawyers, let alone the press or ordinary citizens. But we do know some of the people who are teaching these courses. And as well, we know who should be teaching them but are not asked to teach them. Some of the social context teachers are the most doctrinaire ideologues in the business. So it is not a stretch to call the courses indoctrination rather than education. And uh, I think a form of activism that would be very good to see is people um, protesting at the National Judicial Institute, show us the courses, social context issues, show us the courses. That would be a good thing to do. My friend Grant Brown, uh, a former family law lawyer in Alberta, trained in philosophy and now retired from law because he couldn't stomach the gender bias in the system and the injustices his male clients were subjected to, once wryly commented to me, feminists believe men and women are absolutely equal except in those areas where women are superior. <laughs> it is to uh, Grant's eloquent writings on the family law system that I owe a great deal of my own education on the subject and I'm very grateful to him. And one of the areas in which feminists consider women to be superior is parenting. Grant ascribes uh, gender bias judgments to two different uh, things coming together, two reasons. One is a chivalric attitude we saw in the movie Kramer versus Kramer. Uh, you see this white knight to the rescue syndrome in aging judges who got their law degrees in the 1950s and 60s. They see parenting in the old paradigm of the provider father and the nurturing domestic mother. Uh, they see women as vulnerable and in need of their protection. So it's like the state becomes the new father uh, and takes care of the mother. On the other hand, you have the younger judges, and many of them are women now, schooled in feminist rubrics. Uh, in this paradigm, women must have choices that they didn't used to have. 
work, mothering, a combination, whatever they want. They must not be controlled by men who all, according to feminist belief, would control women if they could. In any case, the result is the same. Women's rights to their children are deferred to by those trained in social context issues. Judicial attitudes are reinforced by political mandarins who've also been trained in social context issues. Indeed, Martin Cochon, uh, then liberal justice minister, neatly summed up the thinking of our political and legal elites when he stated in 2003, men have no rights, only responsibilities. That's the justice minister. And so it would seem. Consider what is the received wisdom of our culture with regard to mother's rights and father's rights. For example, women have the right to conceive a baby through fraud by telling men they are using contraceptives. An unwilling father has no right to refuse to support that baby for the next 18 years. Whereas a woman who doesn't want a baby can hand it over to the state with no financial responsibility whatsoever. Conversely, a baby that is wanted by a father can arbitrarily be aborted by its mother as we, uh, or given away to adoptive strangers, as we saw in the case of Hendricks versus Swan in Saskatchewan. Some of you will recognize that. I don't have time to go into too much detail. But this was a biological father. The mother uh, did not register his name at birth, didn't want him to even know she was pregnant. He found out. He had a DNA test. He, is, he presented himself as willing to have, take the baby. She wanted to give it away. No, nope. she, she wanted to give it away to friends of friends, so in other words, to people that she'd never met before and had no idea about. All she knew was that they had some money in a nice house. And the judge, and even though this father, the biological father, um, had a partner, uh, he, he, was no, he was no longer willing, I mean, able to have more children. This was going to be the only child he ever had. He had a home for the child. He had a room prepared for the child. Uh, the judge said, no, this other family can give this child better benefits. So in other words, money is more important um, than a biological father. Can you repeat the name of that court case? Hendricks versus Swan, S-W-A-N, it's Hendricks, H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S. Uh, this was Saskatchewan, just a few years ago. Uh, women have the right to damage unborn children through substance abuse or knowing exposure uh, to HIV with no penalty, while a man is held criminally responsible for any damage to a fetus during an act of domestic violence. Women who are charged with criminal abuse of children, including murder, are protected by privacy laws, supposedly to protect the child from embarrassment or suffering, while, quote, deadbeat dads who don't or can't pay child support are exposed to public view on the internet, which one might assume would cause pain to a child as well. Men who <coughs> refuse to or cannot pay their child support may have their passports taken away, which is a breach of the mobility rights enshrined in our charter, considered a fundamental right of citizenship, and only applied to the worst criminals who are considered a flight risk. Uh, their houses and computers can be searched without warrant, and even though debtor's prison was abolished in 1868 in this country as inconsistent with our values, can be imprisoned for periods longer than those meted out to cocaine dealers. But women who deny fathers court access to their children are rarely penalized in any way, let alone jailed. This last imbalance really sticks in the craw of anyone who believes justice should be blind. As Judge Jack Watson of Alberta's Court of Appeal commented on one case of denied access, it's not my job to punish mothers. Actually, Judge Watson, if it isn't your job, whose is it? And if it's not, and if not delinquent <coughs> mothers, why do you consider it your job to punish delinquent fathers when they can't or won't pay child support? All of life is transactional. A father paying child support has fulfilled his obligation and is surely entitled to time with his kids. And yet, Judge Watson, who claims it is not his job to punish mothers, has a whole section of family law to back up exactly such a punishment. Alberta's Family Law Act, Section 40, gives judges the power to order compensatory time for missed access, posting of a security against further delinquency, Reimbursement for expenses undertaken in the effort to see the child, uh, imprisonment for up to 90 days, and anything else the court deems appropriate. But this almost never happens. 
This is one quid pro quo our family court judges fail to respect. It is no coincidence that Chris Walker's judge thought that it made sense for Chris to give up seeing his children and hope that they would come around when they were adults as if the loss of six or seven or eight years of fathering one's own flesh and blood were a mere inconvenience and of no special significance. Where do these ideas come from? They don't come from international law, that's for sure. Article 16, subsection 3 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, the family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state. But in this country, the courts are the ultimate legal guardians. We speak of courts giving custody. Custody battles in family court are not about giving a child to one parent. That parent already has custody. When they had custody before they went to court, they were two parents with custody. No, the, co the custody is about taking away children from the other parent. So the words we use are important. And give custody sounds kind of positive, doesn't it? Taking away doesn't sound so positive. But that, in effect, is what custody battles and, and winners are about. The ideas come from a belief system, not from evidence, but from a belief system that assumes a mother's presence is more important to a child than a father's, and that a child needs mothering more than fathering. In reality, it is only in earliest infanthood that a mother's presence may be understood to be crucial. The problem in family court is that judges often retain these anachronistic chivalric feelings about the mother-baby bond and the tender years. They give great weight to the status quo. In their minds, if a, a mother is nursing a baby and, and, and they formed a bond, that's the status quo as if a child is unable to, you know, uh, make that leap to going back and forth between parents or uh, being taken care of by another. Otherwise, they'd never get used to a nanny, would they? Um, so they, do, they, they refuse to recognize that a, children can form flexible habits very quickly and easily, and B, that children's needs change as they grow. Maybe a one-year-old is not, uh, does not need a father all that much, but actually a five-year-old needs a father a lot. A four-year-old needs a father a lot. And as children get older, arguably, as they get into their pre-adolescence and adolescence, I would argue that they need fathers more than they need mothers. I really do think that they need the mothers, but I think if it had to be one or the other, in a way, and both are good, a child growing into adulthood is going to be better off with a father having their back than a mother. Their need for a father is far more important um, for uh, money or more toys or a private school or anything else that judges seem to think is very important. The optimum situation for children is always to have near equal access to both their, their parents. If individual couples, for practical or other reasons, agree that the children are best off with their mother or their father for most of the time, they should have the right to negotiate their own arrangement. Every arrangement should be individually negotiated. Most fathers want equal parenting. The few I know who seek sole custody, in other words, Many mothers want sole custody, and some want equal parenting. Most men that I have had any contact with, I've never had a guy say that he prefers sole custody for himself unless he had fears for his children's safety, or he thought that his, 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 his ex uh, was actually uh, unfit to parent. So I'm sure there are exceptions. But ordinary women should not be blamed, and come back to this, for their tendency to want sole custody. They have been assured by so many educators and child care professionals and judges that it is not harmful to a child to be separated from their father that they see no harm in it. Why should they see harm in it? They're rewarded for it. The easiest way to establish a status quo of sole custody is to remove the other parent from the home by legal means for a period of months or a year. One Alberta judge told my friend Grant that she reckoned 80% of charges of domestic violence or sex abuse of children by fathers during custody battles are false allegations. These allegations have the benefit for the mother of instantly removing the father from the scene, but they do not go to criminal court where proofs would be demanded. 
They simply set up delays that are on the resident parent's side. And by the time they are demonstrated to be false allegations, the damage is done and the alleger is usually not punished. Conversely, allegations of real abuse of the children by fathers against mothers are rarely taken seriously. And as a result, many innocent children have died because the Children's Aid Society, so frequently ready to believe the worst of a father, refused to believe uh, that a mother could harm or be a danger to her children. Of the many examples I could cite, the name Elaine Campione should ring a bell. Uh, the CAS was well aware of Ela Elaine Campione's quixotic and alarming history. Um, she drowned her two little daughters in the bathtub. Uh, sh they knew that she had been, sh had demonstrated many signs of psychosis, that she had been hospitalized in psychiatric wards, believed people were out to kill her and kidnap her children, and exhibited such bizarre and negligent behaviors towards her girls that mother substitutes, including her own mother, had to be constantly parachuted into her, her household if it was to function at all. Yet, the CAS decided the mother was the safe parent because of the wife's never proven allegations of domestic violence against her husband. Mr. Campione fought like a tiger and indebted himself trying to wrest control of the children from a woman he knew to be unstable and a potential risk to them, but nobody listened to him. Why? Because when fathers kill, they are not assigned any motivation but their own evil impulses. When mothers kill, everyone in the system kicks into denial mode and assumes the fault has to lie elsewhere, anywhere, as long as the woman doesn't have to take responsibility for her actions and can be offered sympathy. When fathers show disturbing tendency, the system acts or tries to. When mothers show disturbing behavior, the system protects the victimizer. Uh, just the other day, I received an email from a distraught father who has tried to extricate his daughter from an unhealthy situation, but abetted by social services, the situation persists. The father appends a handwritten letter he received from his desperately missed 11-year-old daughter in which she pleads to join him, writing, I hate staying in this house, uh, she's with her mother and stepfather, because I'm scared. I don't know why, but I feel like I don't want to live anymore. One can only pray that this girl doesn't end up as another example of too little, too late. It is now settled sociological science that fatherlessness is the single greatest predictor for negative social outcomes like drug use, promiscuity, school dropout, and gang membership. There are more than four million single fathers in North America, either through widowhood or they got sole custody or whatever. Four million, that's a pretty big control group. If mothers really are more important than fathers, then by now we should be aware of studies or some reliable evidence that motherlessness is a predictor for worse outcomes than fatherlessness. Since such evidence would bolster feminist arguments for privileging mothers in custody disputes, I think we would be aware of it if it were out there. But whatever literature I have seen on the subject tells me that single fathers do as well or better at parenting than single mothers. On to support payment. <laughs> That's a big topic. Judges may be indifferent to fathers' access to children, but they are frequently irrationally, irrational, irrationally obsessed with maintaining the children's lifestyle through support payments that may have no relevance to the father's current ability to pay. Their willed blindness to reality can have dire results. results. Uh, take the case of Darren White of Prince George, BC. He was ordered to pay $1,071 in child maintenance plus $1,000 in spousal support per month on a gross disability income of $2,200. He was on stress leave. Uh, he was a train engineer. He was already under an order to pay $439 per month child support for his eldest child in another province. In other words, his support orders equaled 114% of his gross income. The judge chose to believe that White was not paying the $439 and that he would soon be back at work. Since his ex-wife was also a train engineer working, it was a puzzlement as to why she needed spousal support, but never mind, the judge ordered him out of the family home, adding the cost of new lodgings to his burden, so Darren went into the woods and hung himself. Variations on this story fill the literature on the injustices of family court. Interestingly, Stat Canada does not keep separate tabs on these suicides. Uh, by the way, 
my, my favorite actuarist is here today, Brian Jacobs, who will confirm for me that uh, in ordinary times, uh, men commit suicide at four times the rate of women, but during custody disputes, uh, it goes up to 12 times. So, uh, I mean, not 12 times the rate, it, it, it goes up to uh, triple the rate of, like, the suicides for women stay flat during custody disputes, and, and men's rates triple. Um, but we don't hear a lot about those suicides, and Stats Canada does not identify them as custody related, nor does the uh, Family Responsibility Office, which is responsible for so many of them. But in Australia, a country much like our own in this regard, uh, a member of parliament heading a committee dealing with the effects of divorce estimated there are about 20 court imposed hardship related suicides a week there. An American academic in the field estimates there are about 1,000 divorce-related male suicides a year in the U.S. <coughs> Spousal and child support guidelines and their failures are a huge topic in themselves, and I have no time to get into them, but I will just say that guidelines, which took the place of individual case assessment some years ago, have not reduced child poverty, which is what they were brought in for. Uh, nor have they, uh, and, and they were brought in to equalize household standards of living. Um, but uh, judges have discretion to move support payments up, but they almost never lower them. In other words, the state was counting on fathers to end the feminization of poverty. But the guidelines don't take into account a father's obligation to a second family or other burdens of a second residence. Within three years of separation, a third of dads and a quarter of moms uh, have new partners, half of which include other children. By nine years after separation, 40% of both dads and moms have second families. So real life isn't like theory. In any case, the scheme hasn't worked. The rate of low-income children remains the same as it was seven years before the guidelines were initiated and seven years after they were in place. As for the Family Responsibility Office or Maintenance Enforcement Program, whatever it's called in the different provinces and its evils, that too is a subject in itself and one I think is probably handled by professionals who work within the system. Uh, and I, that would be an interesting topic to have all on its own. <laughs> Suffice to say that a model of equal parenting would be the most intelligent way to achieve compliance from both parties and a more equitable financial burden for each parent. I have talked long enough. Um, I will end with a quote from Aaron Pizzi, the courageous founder of the women's shelter movement who was disappeared <coughs> from the movement by feminists when she dared to speak the truth about spousal violence being bilateral. At a 2008 conference on domestic violence in Sacramento, California, where she was the keynote speaker, Pizzi told her standing room only audience that for gender politics, quote, Canada is the scariest country on the planet. Scary to men who suffer because of it, certainly, but apparently not to most other Canadians who remain curiously indifferent to the demonstrable uh, misandry, the dislike of men that permeates the institutions that define and shape our culture. Long talk. Thank you.